so this is our third and final little snippet of this lecture. Um, <clears throat> and this is to remind us that as cool as manuscripts are, or other forms of textual technology that we've been looking at um, from the Western tradition, they are not the only forms of cultural transmission. And it's really important that we pause and we acknowledge, okay, so we learned about this one, but it's so, so important that we don't then say, this is the only one, or this is the best one, obviously, just because we know it the best. Um, so we want to think a little bit, and this is the, you know, the sort of small reflective portion. I promise this won't be as long as the other excuse me, as long as the other two, uh, primarily because I do not have the breadth, no, that's it, uh, the depth <laughs> of knowledge in these other textual technology or in these other transmission technologies. Um, but don't worry, I have a whole career ahead of me in which I can learn about them. Um, no, like legit, that's probably what I'm going to do. But... It's important that we understand that these other forms of cultural transmission lead to other culture shapes and values and systems. And sometimes what that means, and I'm going to have to use an ableist metaphor because I don't know how else to express this. It means that we as Westerners can be blind to the fact that there are these rich cultural traditions in these other societies, but we don't know how to see them. We don't have the right eyes. So this is just a survey of what other cultures do to transmit or other societies to transmit their cultures. And this is a sample. It is by no means exhaustive, but I do think that it's a good selection of a variety of forms that might help us to rethink our assumption that text and writing technology is cultural transmission, all of it. Um, so for a long time, we thought that the um, Tawan Tinsuyo uh, Empire did not have written language. Um, and then we discovered that we were super wrong about that. And what they actually do to transmit information is a complex form of not work. Like for real, what you are looking at is, um, it's called a kipu. And this is better known, this culture is better known as Inca. Um, but it is a Tawan Tinsuyo text. It is. And the word text is so great for it because it comes from textile, right? Uh, it is like texture, tissue, right? And this is like a literal textile. <laughs> oh my God, amazing. Anyway, uh, so kipu is super cool. And we just recently figured out that this is text. This is not a garment. This is not decorative. This is not a necklace. This is information, right? I must know how this works. I do not know, and I really want to. Um, hula is a great example. In fact, many cultures have um, oral traditions, which uh, we've already kind of looked at a little bit when we looked at uh, indigenous Americans and the native Hawaiians and the Kumulipo. Uh, but hula is another layer. So it's not just an oral tradition. It is also a performance tradition in which there is meaning in every aspect of the performance. And this is how the Kumulipo is preserved. It is not just preserved as a text or like the words of a language, right? It's a song. It is a dance that has movements. It has a costume. Um, right? Like it's not just that people wear hula costumes, it's that every aspect of this um, hula outfit has meaning, every movement has meaning, and it is all connected to the story that it tells, right? All of that is meaningful, but what it isn't <coughs> is permanent. <laughs> There's no way to record hula in stone. Also, why would you? <laughs> um, if you're a Polynesian person and you're sailing across islands every now and then and finding new homes, you don't want to bring you don't want to bring rocks with you. Like that's bananas. Uh, wampum belts, 
This is a form of indigenous American technology for recording information. These are not just pretty patterns. This is not just an accessory. There is information encoded in the types of beads and their placement, as well as the image that they make and the numbers of the rows and the relationship between the colors and the types of the beads, right? Like this is meaning encoded in a belt. Um, I think they're just called belts because that's what Europeans first thought they were. Um, I don't think they're actually worn as belts. Um, <clears throat> totem poles. There's big totem poles, uh, but there's also small totem poles uh, or, or talking sticks is actually what, like, that's like a thing. That's a real thing. Um, but they, they function in the same way, which is that these tell stories. Often they tell histories. Um, and it, they're actually the, the totem, you know, contrary to modern colloquial expression, it is the person or the object image at the bottom of the totem pole that is the most important. Um, and then the things that are built on top of it are the elaborations of the story from it um, or the history, uh, depending on what your totem pole is for. Uh, so these are, these are outside of Vancouver in British Columbia. Um, <clears throat> So I think that makes them a, a, a Salish band. You know what? I shouldn't say because I don't know for sure. Um, <clears throat> this is a form of cultural transmission. These are not decorative. These have meaning, right? But the meaning that they have cannot be transmitted without the people whose memories they serve, right? So you can't read the whole text of whatever whatever legend this is or, or history in this totem. Um, what you can do is you can see it and then a person who knows what each of these mean can then elaborate, right? So it's not the same as a text where every piece of information is encoded visually or symbolically. It is instead a mnemonic marker where first you have this piece and then it is important that the people remember the piece. And then you have the next piece, and it's important that the people remember that piece, right? And so the totem is really about linking together the big pieces, and then the people retain the memory of the details of those pieces and how they fit together. And I'm, this is our last example of other forms of cultural transmission. We were just talking about you're not going to transport rocks on your boats in the Pacific. Um, Maori tattoos are another form of cultural transmission. Now, of course, they are um, limited to the person on whose body they are inscribed, but this is literally meaningful. Um, so inscribed in the skin uh, in Maori and other Polynesian forms of tattoo are meanings of Maori legend, culture, and even individual accomplishments, right? So the tattooing practices of the Polynesian people is a form of cultural transmission. Now, when you bury a body, <laughs> um, you don't get to keep that and people don't get to continue reading it in skin. Asterisk, asterisk, weird appropriative stuff that happens there. I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, but the key thing here, is that the culture in this way is both transcribed, textual in a way, um, not that different from animal skins, right? It is tattooed on a skin. Um, the culture is transcribed, but it is also living on a body, like an actual alive skin instead of a dead, scraped and cleaned skin. Uh, and which means that when the body on which it exists ceases to be alive, so does the text that that body contains. And so that those portions, some of them will pass on because they have been re-inscribed on other people. Um, and some of them will not because they are particular to that individual human. And unless that individual human does or says or is so important, um, then their components of the story will stay with their body instead of being retranscribed into the tradition um, and the tattoos of the people who survived them, right? So these are all forms of cultural transmission. And for many, many centuries, Europeans did not realize them because they could only recognize text. 
like as we know it, written, writing, symbolic signification, um, letters or logographs. Like we're like, okay, fine. I guess logographs are a form of writing. Um, but you know, we're, we use a phonetic alphabet. Yes based on the word Phoenician, uh, we use a phonetic alphabet to signify what what we're trying to say in symbols. And if we, if a culture didn't do that, we, we were, we as European settler colonists were like, oh, they don't have any form of writing. Oh, they're primitive peoples. They do this barbaric practice where they tattoo their bodies. Failing to recognize the richness, complexity, and meaning behind that practice that was a practice of knowledge, uh, knowledge production and knowledge transmission from generation to generation. It was literally legible in their bodies, but also alive. And this is one of the key things that I really want to end on, is that cultural transmission is not about the objects that a culture produces. It is about the ability of that culture to continue. And so Western, the Western focus on documents and textual culture forgets that some cultures don't write texts and then leave them. Some cultures continue to update their stories and their histories and they continue to use their traditional forms of transmission because those cultures are still alive right and their practice of knowledge transmission depends upon a human to human relationship instead of a human makes an object and then the object holds knowledge there are many cultures where humans hold knowledge and the process of transmitting knowledge is a human process in which the objects or the texts or the inscriptions are only one small part of the transmission of that culture. So we're gonna end there. This is our lecture on cultural transmission and this week, arts and crafts.